All right, so now we're official here as class 13 of Packet 5. Um, parent conference is coming up next week. It's all by Zoom. And so I put together a sign up genius. And um, that is, uh, I, it's, uh, I've never used it before, but it, it'll be through Zoom. But if you sign up, then I'll send you, I'll email you um, your Zoom time. Okay, well, you'll sign up for a time, then I'll email you the Zoom. If they want to come talk to me. I suppose a parent can talk to me anytime they want. If they wanted to like tag team you, and when you're done here uh, with us talking, they, it, they may be at work right now, but I mean, if they, if they wanted to just kind of jump in, take, take your seat, and then it, at two o'clock when we finish, they can just stay if they wanted to. I guess that's another way of doing it. Okay, or email me or whatever. That's coming up next week. Thursday night, Friday morning of next week is our official Zoom times. It doesn't have to be those times though. We can Zoom at other times too. All right. We'll start a little controversial minute today. We're gonna to wrap up the hallway stuff uh, I did a dino hunt today and I'm, I was looking for uh, one and two from five, five. So to keep up with class, you should have one and two done on five, five. You also need uh, three and number three done this weekend, just to keep up with the pace. Also this weekend, uh, if you haven't started it yet, you really should be doing these, you know, and I've had some students ask me questions, but usually I'll say, well, did you check the, have you checked the QR code? And, no, well, you got to have to look at that first, look at that. And then if that doesn't explain it to you, then come talk to me. That's why I put those QR codes on there. So you wouldn't, I'm taking myself out of that process. You shouldn't need me. But if once you watch that QR code, you go, that still doesn't make sense. Then, then we talk. Okay. But at least, Look at the QR code. Look at the the help video first before asking me questions about it. That's what I'm asking. Now, if you do these, you're going to turn these in Thursday, Friday. I think yours. Is, I think everyone's packet five. Yeah, you're going to get yours Friday. So yours is due Friday at midnight. Yours always lags a day. Your these for you. For them, it's due Thursday at midnight for in-class kids. But you can submit these. Uh, probably easiest for you to submit them. And then you'll submit your test as well, your test 5A. We'll just do on submit. We'll just submit this one, okay? Rather than do report stuff. <sighs> okay. And I'll, uh, I guess I'll put that on. I'll put it on Canvas, I guess. Instead of just PDF and T, I'll put it on Canvas, I guess. I don't know. We'll figure that out next week. We met table four. We really do need, I really do need to meet you guys. And we have like a, like once a week, we, we pull one or two people and we talk to them. But we'd have to do it when we're not recording. So maybe I'll remember to do this before we start recording. I don't want to get on the public. All right, so one and two on five, five should be done. Uh, I'll post a key because Friday, well, I'll post a key Monday, I guess, because Monday, one, the, what, the first side should be done. So I'll post a key to that Monday night. The back, if you want to go, you're gonna, you know, you got to do it eventually. You might as well do the back. Uh, four and five will be assigned as homework, probably four on Monday night, five on Tuesday night next week. Just doing a one a night because I know you have, uh, the practice problems as well. So this will be Monday night's homework and this is Tuesday night's homework. Uh, so yesterday uh, in class or in the hallways, some groups went from the table to the floor, some groups went from the floor to the table. So what I had them do today, and there, there's the equation we used to uh, figure out Delta X. So what I had them do today is draw, is do these five, we spent about 15, 20 minutes in class, uh, wrapping up the last of projectile motion. So you have to do this as well, even though you didn't, you weren't in the hallway, we'll make up some data. Uh, yours, 
here, here's the data we'll use for you, for you to have these, you to do these five. We'll say that V naught was 25 feet per second. And we'll say that you you shot off the table. That's that's the most common one. So you shot from the table down to the floor. And what happened if that was the case, delta y for people that did that was negative 3.5. So your delta y will be negative 3.5 feet. So delta y here on this graph. So this is vx. No, sorry. This is x this is vx and let's say our angle let's say our theta is uh say 20 degrees 20 degrees that should be all we need we should really get all the graphs from that uh this is x this is vx or v naught cosine theta these are all versus time time you can get from this as well. Um, and this will be y, oh, this will be y, vy, which is v naught sine theta. This is t, t, and then this is just, of course, negative g, which is 32.2 in this case. So we know the general shapes of these graphs by now general shapes, this will always be flat, this will always be linear, uh, this will always be negative flat. Oh, okay. This will always be negative, this, wherever V naught Y is, it'll stop, start there and it'll come down. And what'll be the slope of this line? What slope gonna be? Negative 10. Well, it'd be that if it was metrics, but because we're doing English, this would be negative 32 uh, feet per second, per second. So that'll be the slope of that line. And this graph, since we're going from the table to the floor, I know the general shape will look something like this. It'll come up and then come back down. But you got to figure out where. So that's not enough. If you give me this, you're going to get something, but you're going to get to full credit. And there's one of these on the test, so you got to kind of know it. This is a lot like, by the way, if you need help with this, go back and work this. Go back and work this problem. Number eight, practice problem number eight. That kind of goes to the scenario of the whole launching in the hallway. And you can watch that with a QR code. You can watch that video and that'll, that'll help you kind of get a feel for what I want here in this graph. This is good practice for the test anyway. Okay, because there'll be one like that from, like from our hallway data. Let's assume that this, this, and this. Now plot the five graphs that go with it. Okay. So, um, let me hit pause. Okay, so we're back to work. One of the questions, we're back on air here. One of the questions was, uh, how do we find delta x? You can't use the range equation. You have to use time. You have to use, how do you find time? Well, you can find time using the blue quad. And so we said, you know, there, that, that right there will give you time because you know everything in there. You know delta y, g, theta, v naught. And then you can use that. Once you have that, you can use it to find delta x. Okay. So now, now we're ready to start. Um, conservation of momentum. So I'm going to change what I'm sharing. Share another screen. Hold on. Get that right. Okay. And let me share the screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Share it. All right. So this is from my old, my, uh, my website from five years ago uh it's you know it's it's still pretty handy it's it's physics.org it's ascifysics.org and um it's got a lot of good stuff on there just a lot of information good re good reference 
But anyway, on here, this physics animation. So I want to go through these physics animations and just the ones that pertain to this. These are not really in any, they're kind of the order that I, that I uh, found them in. So here's this one. We'll start off with this one here. Talking about, and we're talking about inertia. We're back to talking about inertia. And so here's a good example of inertia. Inertia is really what's going to kill you in a car accident. Because your body wants to keep going. So here, this accident, hopefully it works. I won't do that now. All right, so this is a, uh, no, nobody was hurt on this. You can see this, I guess. Uh, but this is a, uh, um, shows, kind of shows inertia. And uh, people think, well, with their car, they're driving, they can grab a hold of a, of, a, of a shoulder rest or something and they'll be okay. But you don't have any time. You're like a rag doll. So this, what happened was the, the, the they were acted upon by an unbalanced force. And okay, here's an example of conservation of angular momentum. Uh, this is a quad, and most adults cannot do a quad. Even professional skaters uh, can't do it. This girl's got just the right size, shape, uh, and weight to easily pull it off without even skating into it. But the cool thing is, and this is conservation of angular momentum, which is something called LI, capital LI equals LF. And we'll study it in detail, uh, second semester of AP Physics. But uh, in here, um, in this class, we mostly study conservation of linear momentum and we study conservation of energy. Uh, but that we don't really get to conservation of angular momentum because it involves uh, calculus. Um, so but the cool thing about it is the physics that dictates her quad is the same physics that dictates neutron stars uh, spinning very quickly. Uh, that is launched to Uranus in three seconds. <laughs> um, okay, here's an example of a golf ball hitting a wall and it was shot out at I don't know how many miles an hour um, very quickly out of a cannon into a wall. And look at you, you think of it, we see it 24 frames a second. So we never see that pancake. Uh, this is a practice ball. It's not just a rubber ball, though. This is actually a golf ball. It's a cheaper version of a golf ball. But golf balls do temporarily deform. And so a lot of energy is taken up, obviously, to get that ball to do that. Well, we, we would, when we did this problem, and we're going to do a problem like this next week, we would assume this is an elastic collision. But elastic collision means that nothing is lost, no energy is lost, no kinetic energy is lost which is ridiculous because a lot of energy gets lost there to heat, but we still make that, that first assumption uh, that that is an elastic collision. We'll get to those in a second. Here's a recoil. Um, now, this guy's did, he's good because it's a very loud gun. Uh, where is that, a, what is that, 44 or something? I don't know, it's a big gun, uh, but this, what what's his mistake he makes that shouldn't be happening what what, what mistake did he make uh, um his elbows look locked so he locked his elbow so he has no cushion there he has no spring action there and so uh the gun has no choice that gun recoils with the same momentum that that bullet moves forward at not the same velocity but the bullet's a lot less massy than the gun but it's moving at supersonic speeds. And so you multiply velocity times mass uh, to get momentum. And so even if the, even if the gun were 100 times more massive than the bullet, it's still gonna come out a lot of velocity back towards him. So this is called recoil. We'll, we'll get to that equation here in a little bit. Here's another one. Uh, this, is a, this is sort of recoil. This is recoil with initial velocity. And in this case, the little gerbil uh, has no chance. The gerbil has to make the, the, the momentum must be conserved. Let's assume the little girl caught the gerbil. Uh, but the but the gerbil, because it has no mass, 
has to make up for that uh, by its velocity. Uh, the ball's got a lot more mass than the gerbil does. It, it bounces some, but the gerbil uh, has to go a lot faster, or the hamster, whatever it is. Here's an example of conservation of angular momentum. As the cat walks counterclockwise, the chair has to go clockwise because things that rotate, the momentum has to be conserved in a closed system. And that chair kind of represents a closed system. Um, 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 that's fine. Okay, here's one. Here's a guy uh, with his recoil. Uh, oh, all right. So he probably shouldn't drink beer and shoot rifles at the same time, but uh, he's got it all figured out. And I think he did kind of bend his elbow. But these these uh, rifles, they have a kickback. You got to really nestle that in your shoulder. It's got a big kickback. Uh, let's see. I think that's it. Okay, now I want to show you the other two things. It turns out that conservation of, of momentum, angular and linear, also works subatomically. So here's an electron, and you learned in chemistry that electrons repel electrons, and yet then you ask, well, why is that? And then um, the chemist teacher said, well, because like charges repel. And you go, oh, well, that explains it, but it doesn't really explain it. I mean, that's what we say to you, and you're supposed to learn that, but this is why. When this electron comes along here, it's gonna spontaneously shoot out a photon, okay? When it does, that's recoil, like shooting a bullet out of a gun, and that one bounces back. The other one comes along, it's gonna catch that photon, absorb that photon, and then it will turn and go the other way. So it's basically conservation of momentum, okay? Two-dimensional momentum. Here's an example of a, a neutron turning into a proton. A neutron has an up and two down quarks. A proton has a two up quarks and a down quark. What happens is one of those down quarks will spontaneously uh, spit out a W boson. When it does that, uh, it'll pop out an electron and a neutrino will get involved. So all this happens, but when it does, the, the point is that that neutron comes along and it's a recoil action. It bounces back the other way and then gives off these. And these thing is all momentum is conserved. So if you add up the velocities in the X and the Y direction, it still adds up at the end to the same as the as mass times velocity was at the beginning. Okay, so those are examples. I'll stop that sharing and go back to the other one. All right, now about 20 years ago, I got tired of having to kind of wave my arms and uh, say to people, well, here's, here's conservation momentum. We would try and do it with wooden carts. We'd slam them into each other. We had little springs on them. And we got just terrible, terrible data, awful data. And so it was almost, the data was so bad, you couldn't really use it because, the, you know, tell you why on Monday, why you couldn't use it. But I, I thought, well, if I just had better instruments. So I we went ahead and uh, wrote a, a series of grants totaling around $5,000 when you add them all up. Now it wouldn't cost as much. But back then we had to get this air track. We got these, back in the day, it was very expensive photo gates. We got these, these, these timers that go to the nearest 10 thousandths of a second. And we got this vacuum system. So all this stuff we got to, to, to have a frictionless uh, linear air track. And so Monday I'll show you, we'll, we'll demonstrate that in class and I'll show you the video on Monday where we finally tried to show it for real uh, and actually you quantify it, but uh, you'll see Monday why it didn't work. It was a waste of money. Okay, so now let's go five, six. We'll start, we'll introduce this idea. We'll probably wrap up a little early. Um, so we start off with what is inertia? This is five, six. So we talked about inertia. Anybody want to uh, chat or um, say it, what they say inertia is? Or a word that comes to mind? Resistance to Resistance, motion. Right? Resistance to motion. So I'm going to go one better than that. Uh, I agree with you. And we have it here on our t-shirt. 
This is on our equation sheets. And this is from equation sheet number seven. And it says Newton's uh, first t-shirt edition, first law t-shirt edition. Objects resist acceleration. That resistance is the inertia. So it's, so it's really not just, it's not a resistance to motion. It's a resistance to change in motion. So it's a resistance to, like once it's moving, it doesn't resist motion anymore. It wants to keep moving. Uh, it's resistant, but if you change it, if you slow it, it's not going to want to slow down either. So um, that's inertia. So we say it's resistance to acceleration is a better way of defining it. It's any masses resistance to acceleration, which is change in velocity. Now that could be direction or speed. Like if I'm walking straight and I keep my same speed, but I start to veer left, that requires something to make me do that. And I'm gonna resist doing that. I'm gonna to have to, for I'm gonna need a force, an unbalanced force acting on me to make me do that. So it's resistance to any kind of acceleration. Uh, so in third hour, they asked, well, what about light? I mean, light is light doesn't have mass. And so you need to have mass, right? To have inertia is measured by the, it's measured by mass. Uh, one of these questions down here says, how do we measure inertia? And the answer is the mass of the object. Uh, but um, light has no mass, so does light have inertia? Um, no, uh, it doesn't. Um, it, but so then the question is, does light resist? It doesn't have mass, so why would it resist change or why would it resist acceleration? And the thing is, light only moves at one speed. It only moves at the speed of light in a vacuum, right? So you can't, you can slow light down through glass. That's how, that's refract, refract, sorry, refraction is light slowing down through glass. That's why things seem to bend in glass. You put a pencil in a glass of water, it seems to bend. It's because light itself, the light freak waves slow down in a medium. But um, light is not like material things. Uh, so it doesn't, you, you don't really bring in this conservation momentum with light. Light only responds to he a heavier medium or if it's in space and there's no medium, it responds to curvature of space time through a heavy object like a sun or like a planet. Um, that's what that's how light is affected. But for mass, we, we're talking about massive things. Even electron is massive, has a mass, a rest mass. Okay, so um, what is momentum? Then momentum is like moving, that's moving, moving inertia. And we've mentioned this before, but now we're gonna get serious about it and do, do equations and quantify everything. It's a scalar vector. So uh, I'll get to that here. The symbol we use, we'll answer it all at once. The symbol we use is little p. I say little p because big P we use for power. So capital P is power. And we'll get to that later on. Little p is momentum. So little p equals simply mass times velocity. That's it. So it's moving inertia, the moving part, that's your velocity, the inertia part, that's your mass. It's a scalar or vector. Well, because velocity is a vector and mass is a scalar, uh, scalar times a vector is a vector. So momentum is a vector, little p. I always wondered why it was called little p or why it was called p. Um, and uh, finally, I didn't understand it uh, in college. I didn't have physics in high school like you do, but in college I had it and I thought, why is it called p? Why, why would they pick p? And finally, as a teacher, I read about it uh, it comes from impetus. Newton, of course, Newton came up with it, but Newton um, said that things have this impetus. And so that's where the P, he used the P out of that word to, 
for momentum. Okay. Uh, it says is a, is a mass. Mass is a scalar. Mass doesn't have any particular direction. It's not a vector. It's not an arrow. You have your mass. You all have mass just sitting there in your chair. I have mass. I have inertia sitting there. I don't have momentum unless I'm moving relative to what, right? I am moving relative to the center of the earth, but I mean, I'm relative to the sun, but relative to this room I'm in right now, I'm not, my center mass isn't moving. So I have no, I have no momentum, but I do have inertia. I still have that, I'm still resisting motion. Uh, the metric units, of course, are kilograms. And for metrics, we're gonna use either MKS, meters, kilograms, seconds, or we're gonna use CGS, centimeters, grams, seconds, and those two um, types we use. For English, it's called slugs, slugs. Uh, and slugs, we'll, we'll use that in the FSS system, feet, slugs, seconds. So we use three systems in, in this class, pretty much any physics class you have. You're gonna use MKS, CGS, or FSS. MKS probably 75% uh, of the time, um, CGS maybe 5% of the time, and then uh, the other 20% will use FSS, okay? Uh, so in class, I have a scale in there, so I step in the scale. Someone said, well, what is, well, can you tell me what, it, what is mass? I mean, I to feel it. I said, well, okay. So I stepped on the scale and I weighed 191 pounds. And they said, well, is that, is that your mass? No, that's not my mass. That is your weight is your mass times gravity. So my weight changes, you know, no matter where, where I am. In fact, my weight changes walking around my classroom. Uh, I weigh less standing on the east side of my class, sorry, the west side of my classroom than I do on the east side of my classroom. I gain weight when I walk from east to west, sorry, from west to east in my classroom. I messed that up. Yeah, so west I weigh less, east I weigh more. But my mass doesn't change. But, but because gravity itself changes uh, from, we actually measure it uh, with a, with a um, galvometer. It's a, it's a machine that measures uh, gravity and a $50,000 instrument. And I had a guy who's a geophysicist would come and give an eight week seminar on geophysics. Unfortunately, he died uh, about 10 years ago. The Dr. Whitten was his name and uh, Alan Whitten. And um, maybe more than 10 years ago. Anyway, so he was an amazing guy, but he brought in this galvanometer. We, we actually measured to the, this gave it to like, eight sig figs, we measured it, and gravity changes depending on where you're at in the room. And we have reasons for that, but we can't get into it yet. We gotta do some more stuff first. So the point is that, that, you're, that it's still my mass. I am measuring uh, on a scale, you are, you're, you're, measuring your, you're measuring your mass, your weight, which is actually, so if that's pounds, okay, if that's pounds, then that is, uh, 32.2 feet per second squared associated to gravity, and that is slugs. So when I, if you do the numbers, for me, I'm about 5.9, so ASCII today anyway, is about 5.9 slugs. In England, they talk about stones, and that's, a whole, that's another way of measuring uh, it gets confusing. We, we use pounds on the scale here. In England, they use kilograms, but it's kilogram weight. It's weird. Uh, and then they also use this thing called stones, which is really ancient. But that's kind of, that's common in England to say, well, I'm, you know, so many stones. Okay. So now let's do one last thing and then we'll call her good. And let's go ahead and get these equations out of the way. These are called the yellow equations. because We put them on, we, a girl one year, really good student, put them on these, the yellow, big, nice poster board. We hang in the room, but this is, and I'll do, there'll be an equation sheet on this coming up next week, probably. But this is uh, 
contravation and momentum, which simply says that the summation of all the momentums before something occurs, before there's a collision, or I shoot a gun and a bullet comes out of a gun, that's after, before we say sometimes before, we say just before collision or just before recoil, that if I add all those up, and those are those are vectors, I will get this, it'll be the same as the momentum at the end. I don't care if it's a fireworks explosion. I could have one thing go up and it blows up into a thousand bits and pieces of the fireworks. If you add up, and this includes the directions, right? So sines and cosines. If you had the time to add all those up, all the momentum in the X would be the same as it was to begin, and all the momentum in the Y would be the same as it was to begin with. So to break this up then, to if we had two, let's say we have two things colliding on, on rail, railroad tracks. So there's no, it's not two dimensions. Let's say, let's keep it simple. Then I would have M1 V1 naught plus M2 V2 naught, uh, being the initial, you can say initial if you want, equals M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. So not hard, there's no squares involved. There's no integrals or derivatives or power rule. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the math next week should be pretty easy for you. Uh, of course, it always starts off that way. And then, then we bring in two dimensional collisions and all of a sudden it becomes a nightmare. But one dimensional collisions are fairly easy to handle. So then we have inelastic collisions. That's if I take uh, two lumps of clay and smash them together. Let's say the typical example in physics is a bullet into a block. So I shoot a bullet into a clay block and that bullet sticks in that block. And then the whole clay block, say it's on ice and the whole thing slides. And so on, what's the momentum to begin with? In that case, I'm gonna have, uh, I'll have M1, M1 V1 naught plus M2 V2 naught. And that's gonna add up. They're gonna combine the M1, the M2, M1 plus M2 times some V final, okay? So that's, we'll work problems like that. And then we have recoil. Now in recoil, what I'm trying to emphasize here is all these, all of these that I'm gonna give you all come from this. They all come from this equation. All I'm doing is manipulating that equation. You don't have to memorize equations in this class, uh, but uh, that would be the one you'd have to know, then you can just manipulate it. Okay, so the other one is recoil. What if a, if a, if a gun, if you ever hold a gun, you shoot a bullet, well, initially there's no velocity. So initially it's zero uh, momentum. And then at the end, you have the mass of the gun, M1 V1 final, plus the mass of the bullet, M2 V2 final. So that's another example of finding this recoil if I'm going along and I'm running along, like, like a lot of this is physics engines for uh, when you're playing first shooter, first shooter games, Call of Duty, wherever you're running along and you're shooting something, if it's a good physics engine, it'll include recoil with initial velocity. That would be I'm running along M1, I have the bullet in my gun, M1 plus M2 times some initial velocity that we're running at, V0. Then it's gonna split up, the bullet's gonna go this way, me and the gun are gonna recoil so that would be M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. So as you can tell, these are all just modifications of that general equation. Okay, and that's where the lead class is. Okay. All right, any questions? So remember, uh, I'll have out your notes. Um, and your packet fours on the front porch in, in your folder. Sometimes a notebook won't fit in there. In that case, I'll put it below. Um, but by six o'clock tonight, you've got to come by and pick up your, uh, if you want to do black and blue, if you weren't one of those that were here on Wednesday, if you're here on Wednesday, then you're going to get those black and blue points by thumbs up. We already did that. But if you weren't here, you're going to have to show me do it on your test and my, your test already is on the front porch if that's what you're looking for but uh that's due to be submitted um tonight by midnight but i know you're rushing to get that done 
uh, I'll allow you guys to submit it. I'm not going to allow the in-class kids to do it. So, I will, so this is between you and me. I'll allow you. I won't. If it counts off late, let me know, and I'll change it to okay if it's by tomorrow night. So be, I'll give you an extra day uh, if you're doing if you're ever do that front porch thing. Now, if you were here on Wednesday, just ignore it. You don't need to worry about all that's done. The blues and the blacks are all done. Okay. All right. So. Uh, I shouldn't have recorded that. Now they're going to hear that. Oh, well. So we'll stop sharing. Stop the recording.